we're very fortunate today to have one of the foremost sports personalities in all of the Pacific Northwest. She's also an author, uh, Jen Mueller from Root Sports. Hello, Jen. Hello, guys. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, just a little bit more before we get into the topic of the day, which is, um, you know, how much longer are we going to have to sit? Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, being in sports journalism, uh, I mean, everybody out there thinks, wow, what a glamour job you have. Yes, and I will say that there were many times prior to COVID-19 where we've been forced to stay inside where I thought my job is anything but glamorous. Working in sports is awesome, but it is a job, and there are days where you don't feel like going into work. Although I keep reprimanding myself for ever thinking that because now I would give anything to be in a ballpark for 14 hours or sitting through a 16-inning game or a two-hour rain delay. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things. I spent a lot of time waiting around for things to happen, and now I would give anything to be standing outside a locker room or clubhouse waiting for something to happen. How many sports do, are, do you work in? So currently I work for the Root Sports broadcast team, which is Mariners and Big Sky Football. And then I'm the sideline radio reporter for the Seahawks. Okay, wow. Two of the biggest ones, that's for yeah. sure. And you're also an author? I am. I have written and published three books through my company, Talks Me To Me. Wow, what are the books about? Communications, right? It is communication and it's business communication. And the very first one, which needs to be updated, was how to become a sports for business. If you did not grow up around sports and you read how to things online, it will tell you to start by learning the rules of the game. And that is not how any sports fan actually talks about a game. I have a very practical approach to doing that. And then it's about how to use sports conversations in different ways, whether it's to build business relationships or to, sh to set yourself up as a leader. It is communication skills that come from out of a locker room. Well, when our classes get to be live, they're actually at Cheney Stadium in Tacoma. And so we get to hear from the people in the Rainiers quite a lot. And they talk that, that very thing about the experience at the ballpark is so important. And that's where you learn as opposed to other places. Yeah, I mean, you've got to be around people, not to take away from anything that they're learning in classes, but it is different when you have to be out there in real life. And I'll tell you, related to the NFL draft, so if you're a sports fan and you're watching how the NFL draft went, I listened to Pete Carroll and John Schneider talk about things, and one of the big storylines going into the draft was, will the communication work? Because everything is virtual and Zoom related, right? And so... John Schneider was asked, does this mean that there's more emphasis on the talent evaluators this year? And he said, no, there's more emphasis on the communication because if you can communicate at a higher level and if you know the people around you, you're going to be better off when communication is just a little bit slower. So that was really important to hear. And you have those communication skills and build relationships when you were at the ballpark and engaging with other people. The other thing I'll say from the NFL draft, since we're talking sporty and the class will get this and they're all sports fans, take a look at how many people the Seahawks drafted that had huge hurdles to overcome. That has always been something that they've done, but everybody is looking for that resiliency factor right now. And the Seahawks intentionally went out and got guys that they knew had overcome big things because when we all get back to normal, whatever normal looks like, you're going to have to show that same resiliency and ability to transition and kind of go with the flow. So everybody's kind of doing the same thing we are right now, just in, in different ways in sports. Well, let's talk about the past several months, uh, or at least it seems like the past several years, even though yeah. it's only, it really hasn't been that long, I guess. Um, how has it been for you work-wise? I have not had this much time off during the spring in, I don't know, 20 plus years. Um, it's been really, it's been interesting. It's been tough. We have found ways to do interviews with athletes via Zoom, and we're putting them on social media through Root Sports, and we're actually looking at producing 30-minute shows from our homes, doing all the work from home, and then putting those on the air. So we're finding ways to make it work, but it's, 
you know, it's tough. And I miss things like games, but I also miss being with my colleagues. I miss the relationships in the locker room. I miss the fan interaction during a game. It's, um, there's been some moments that have not been so pretty for me as I sit there and, and sulk and have a pity party for myself in the corner, but we're all learning to adapt and pivot. Well, the, the adapt and pivot is something that really, this is what we're, we're talking with the class about. And in fact, the class has a project that uh, they have to, they're taking a single sport, uh, okay. you know, they're based in teams and, and there's a, uh, 15 teams in the class and they have to come up with a marketing plan for their sport post coronavirus. Ah. So um, I'll, I'll let you, uh, you know, reveal the secret. Well, you know, how do you get uh, sports restarted? Gosh, if I had the answer to that, I would be the most popular person, certainly in the United States and maybe in the world. Uh, look, it's going to start slowly, and it has started slowly in some places, but certainly there's not going to be fans around for a while. And so I think in terms of marketing, you're marketing, you are going to be marketing to a hungry, hungry audience. And I think one of the cool things that you will have available to you now is people who never considered themselves sports fans, but are A, so hungry for something to watch outside of what they've been binge watching for the last six months or three months, however, six weeks or three months, right? But people who always said, I wish I could see the personality of these guys. I wish I could see what they were doing in the community. I wish it wasn't all just about what they were doing on the court or the field, you know, or the pitch. That's all you have heard about these athletes during the time of the coronavirus. You have heard how they have impacted their community. And so you're going to have an entirely new group of sports fans that wouldn't have paid as close attention previously. And you are gonna have sports fans that are really hungry for something. I believe sports comes back before anything else. And we're seeing that a little bit, right? The governor said that golf courses can reopen. You've got North Carolina saying that you can go and work on your NASCAR um, shops. You've got different things going. And so from a marketing standpoint, you get to beat everybody to the punch, but you are gonna to have to think about what it looks like to not be able to market to people in an arena for a while. So oh, is it about media? Can, can all sports survive? Oh, well, I'll just get you know, kind of right to the point. Um, uh, we're, you know, again, we're at the home of the Tacoma Rainiers, which is a, you know, a wonderfully run organization, but they're not allowed to get on the ballpark. And when they do, they, they don't have a big TV contract. Yeah, and that one is going to be interesting. Um, I don't think Triple A would go anywhere. I think that minor league baseball, it certainly was different, but minor league baseball feeds into the major league teams, and major league teams need minor league teams to survive. So somewhere along the line, they are going to come up with a plan to stick together. They are going to rely more on camps, podcasts. I think one of the cool things that have come out of this is that there's a lot of innovation in how do you use Zoom. And But I do think minor league baseball and college teams outside of college football will reduce their travel schedule because that is a huge cost to teams. And I think you're going to see longer series with the same teams in minor league, or you're not going to see as much travel just to reduce those costs. Well, let's talk about restarting baseball. Uh, from a marketing standpoint, I heard you say that there are hungry people out there and so they're ready to be marketed to. But what do you market them for? I think you market them for access to players because players are willing to give it and fans want it. And so instead of having people in the stands, now these are just my thoughts. I have not heard this bantered about anywhere else. But, you know, we have seen players connect using their cell phones and through Twitch and through Zoom interviews. I mean, anybody can do a Zoom interview these days. And so what I think some of the interesting things are that would be new 
sources of marketability or engagement with players would be, you know, you're not going to have meet and greets on the field anymore, but you could get players to send personalized messages to a group of fans, right? You could get sponsorship deals that could match up fans and a virtual experience with a player. You're going to have that. You are certainly going to have a lot of people watching TV and listening to radio broadcasts. You've got that option. I would not be surprised if there isn't another esports virtual type element that gets included into those normal broadcasts. They were already going that direction. Take a look at what NASCAR has done over the last few years, where you can tune into different channels and you can hear different drivers in the communication that they have with their teams. It's harder to do that in as far as miking up players in football or baseball, but it wouldn't surprise me that now that we've seen some of these esports become more mainstream in the last few weeks, it wouldn't surprise me if that could be an included element that would that would be part of packages now. But look, you are still marketing towards a community of people that is hungry to have human connection again and hungry to talk about something other than the coronavirus. So, you know, there's going to be, in some ways it's going to be easy because they're going to be ready for it. And in other ways, you're just going to have to find different elements to highlight. So how long does the honeymoon last? See, I'm biased on that one. And I'm a sports fan. And I think that once sports comes back, you're going to see the honeymoon period last for a long time because people now know what it feels like to not have anything. And depending on who you're marketing to and where you're marketing, you know, if you're used to marketing in a stadium, as you mentioned, the Rainiers, that's going to be, you know, a tougher task for a long time. It's going to be at least a year before that gets back, in my opinion. It gets back to what you had experienced before, but I don't think there's going to be a drop-off or desire to watch sports for a while. All right, let's talk about football in two different places. Yep. There's the Seahawks, which, of course, everybody is just, they they can hardly wait. And then there's Big Sky Football that you talked about. Mm Mm-hmm. Two completely different approaches, right? Yes. And two very different types of revenue streams, right? You've got NFL dollars, you've got national broadcast dollars, and then you've got smaller dollars, certainly when you're dealing with big sky football. Here's what football does for most athletic departments, and I'm this is no surprise, right? They fund most of the other sports that are happening in athletic departments. So they are going to do a lot to get football back on the field. However, schools at this point are very reluctant to say that games can start if athletes cannot also be in school and if students aren't allowed on campus, um, they're not going to let those games happen. I wonder at what point they start shifting gears because you will end up losing a lot of um, athletes and a lot of teams if there's no finances to keep them afloat. From the NFL point of view, you're trying to augment game day in different ways. You know, I have not yet talked to the marketing department about what they would be doing for something even like training camp. They would get 3,000 people out on the berm at the VMAC during training camp. That's a huge amount of, you know, people and fan interaction and engagement that you're not going to be able to have at this point in time. So my guess is you start going to high touch communication. Right. You've already cultivated the list of fans that you've been in communication with. Now, again, you're going to have players that start doing personalized messages. You're going to give them video tours inside the locker room or inside, you know, the the video room or the weight room, places that they wouldn't have seen previously just to keep that relationship going, in my opinion. Is that something that the that the teams are ready to do? I mean, I know in in baseball, the uh, baseball players seem to be far more protected than uh, the football players. You know, I think that this is gonna open up a lot of different things. I would say that in the past, you wouldn't have seen much of any of that. You know, you were starting to get that hunger in the last couple of years where people wanted all access views. So if you were at a game at CenturyLink, they had a game, they had a camera that was in the locker room so that you could see the players when they went in, had the little pep talk and then came out. The interesting thing is, 
you know, they were trying to keep people engaged in the stadium because the broadcast had gotten so good with camera angles and HD and replays. And, you know, you could have your own food in the house and you didn't have to stand in line to go to the bathroom. They were already going towards some of these things things in other ways to make sure that fans were engaged and still buying tickets and and still attending on game day so they're set up but i couldn't even imagine having a video camera in most baseball clubhouses right even in protected times right pre-game or post-game when we're just doing interviews you know you don't have live cameras in those situations i, I think there's going to be a lot that's on the table as a result of what's going on now we're going to go as far as the what the XFL did this past year. That was kind of fun to watch. I no, I don't think so. You're talking about like play, um, actually hearing play calls. Yeah, hearing play calls, and then on the sideline, and uh, uh, yeah, the, I, the coaches' personalities came through too. <laughs> they did. Um, I still think that there's so much money involved in the NFL that they're not going to do that quite yet. Um, I think that they're going to keep it pretty close to the vest because when you've got as much on the line as an NFL coach does, they don't want to take any chances with anybody hearing any of that and scouting it out and tipping people off and then having to change essentially their play calls and signals every week. I don't think it's going to go that far, but you know, you might hear more mic'd up guys during a game. Um, we had a, a great opportunity to talk with Maya Mendoza of the Sounders. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, one of the things that she was talking about is what do you do with the season ticket holder if you are required to maintain social distance? Uh, is it every other game? I mean, uh, are you hearing anything about how the, the leagues and the teams are going to approach social distancing? The only thing I have heard is essentially giving people a few seats you know, in the right in the row, right? So if you came, if it was you and your spouse or you and your your family of four, you would be allowed to sit together, but then you'd have to have two or three seats in between you. I honestly do not know what the logistics would look like of that because that would be a huge challenge for a team like the Seahawks and the Sounders who have a waiting list, right? Seahawks have a waiting list for years to get season tickets. It's not like you can redeploy those people elsewhere in the stadium and keep them all happy. You know, I, I don't know how that's going to work um, in the beginning. I should probably make some calls on that one, but it would be interesting, you know, on every other or every couple of games, but even then every other, if you fill the entire CenturyLink stadium every game, you'd probably have to go through the entire season with only giving them one game to get enough social distancing in there. Well, I don't think that that would sit too well with, <laughs> with those people who have spent a lot of money over the years. Probably not, which is why, you know, I, I do think for as much as fans want to go back to games, I, I think there's going to be a lot of fans that self-select out, right? They're just going to choose to stay at home. They're going to play it safe. And I think that for all of the reasons that we've just talked about, it's going to be easier just to say, no fans at sporting events for a year, right? Or until the next season comes up for precisely that. You're trying to even it out so that you're not playing favorites with this group or that group and then starting fresh and offering something else in return. Again, a virtual meet and greet with a player or something that sweetens the pot a little bit in the interim when they realize that everybody's in the same boat just waiting to get back to the stadiums. It kind of sounds like the media is even more important for the success of sports than it used to be. I would think so. And certainly as a member of Root Sports, I do think our viewership will go up when sports returns. However, I don't know that games are going to be covered the way that they were in the past. I don't know if we will be able to do interviews next to players for a period of time. It could involve putting a headset on a player and talking to him from six feet away or from up in the booth instead of right next to him. It could involve me getting a boom mic, which is a mic on the end of an extension pole to be able to get sound. Um, it could be pre-recorded things where both of us have microphones and, and we're doing it remotely. So I do think that media is important. I don't know yet what it looks like to actually cover a game. I don't know if there's going to be announcers in stadiums for a while. You know, one of the things that they've done with international soccer games is provided a feed 
that just gets sent back. Let's say the game is being called by ESPN. It gets sent back to Bristol and there's announcers who are in the studio calling the game off of a video feed. That could very easily happen when baseball restarts and they have the equivalent of spring training games again. You know, it, it, there's going to be a really big question as to how all of our lives and jobs change as a result. Sounds like your job just got tougher. It might. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad that I still have a job. Um, and I think that that's where relationships get really important. You know, it comes back to the fundamentals, right? Communication, relationships, how you treat people, and an empathy with with which you operate right now. Am I gonna get frustrated if I can't talk to players in the same way that I used to? Yes, but do I understand why it's happening? And you know that we're all just trying to do the best that we can? Yes, I do. And so that's where that just human element comes back into play. Well, thank you very much for talking with us and for talking with our students. Uh, I wish that they could hear you in person, but the circumstances are different. So let's do leave them with one thing. You have had tons of experiences over the years. What do you think is one of the most fun ones that you've had in your job? I would say in any interaction with Marshawn Lynch has been a pretty fun one. Um, I have had many conversations with him off the record, not about football. I will say he first walked back into the Seahawks locker room. He walked right up to me. He was talking on the phone. He gave me a big hug, a big old kiss on the cheek. Didn't stop talking to whoever that he was talking to. Said hi to me and kept going. Right after he had played in his first game, we were, I was getting ready to close out my 2019 books for Talk Sporty to me. So I was setting Q1 goals. And he is a business owner. And he is really big into business and investing and, and being smart with your money, as you know, take care of your monies, take care of your chicken, uh, take care of your mentals. Um, and so I walked up to him in the locker room. I said, hey, I just, I'd like to know, um, I, what should I be paying attention to as a business owner? And he looked at me and he said, you've been doing that a long time, Jen, you don't need my advice. I said, I know, I just kind of, I want to hear, I, I just want to hear what you have to say. What, what's been the biggest challenge you've had as a business owner? And he said, trusting people. I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, do you put them through a test? Or he said, no, I just watch how they work. I'm like, okay, that's cool. He was like, see, you already know this. Why are you asking me? I said, well, if I already know this, then why aren't I making any more money? And he said, because you spend all your time up here, Jen. Spend more time on your business. And I thought, okay, Barry Marshawn, the following week, we're on a plane and we are heading, I forgot where we were heading. And I see Marshawn walking up and down the aisles. This is after we've taken off, we're in the air, and he is talking to every single person at every single seat. He's walking on the other side of the plane from me, and he circles back around, and he's got a Chick-fil-A bag in his hand. And he looks at me, and he goes, hey, do you get per diem money? And I said, yeah, I get per diem money. He goes, you want to buy a chicken sandwich? And he had... In the Chick-fil-A bag, purchased too many sandwiches for the running back group to eat, and he was selling Chick-fil-A sandwiches on the plane for per diem money. I did not purchase one, but I thought, what a hustler and what an entrepreneur. Like, no, who else would have done that? Here he is making millions of dollars. He's got plenty in the bank, and he is hustling chicken sandwiches from Chick-fil-A. I just thought between that and my business advice that I will, I will never forget that exchange with Marshawn. Jen Mueller, thank you very much for talking with us. Uh, we'll look forward to cheering from the sidelines for you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.